All right, Israel, how's, how's it going, everybody? We are back in here. You are at reach, each one, reach one. I appreciate you guys making your way to my section of the YouTube universe. All right, we're gonna we're gonna continue our study. Give me liberty or give me death today. We are on part thirty-seven. Uh, again, uh, apologize for yesterday, you guys. I had the brief technical difficulty, so I had to split up lesson thirty-six into two parts. There's a thirty-six A and a thirty-six B. All right, make sure you check both of those out. All right, been, I've been looking forward to getting to this word all day. So I, I really don't wanna delay any further, but let us first give all praise, honor, and glory to our heavenly father. Glorious and blessed be his name. We pray in the name of our beloved Lord and savior, our loving master, redeemer, big brother, Yahweh Shai, all praises due. Grace, peace, and blessings to my family, the elect of Israel. I love you guys. Thanks for joining me. Give me liberty or give me death, part 37. Let's get it. All right, so as you can see on the screen, we're gonna be beginning today in, in Luke, all right? So everybody bring up Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Okay, Luke chapter 16, verse 14. All right, now, what we're picking up from, just to give you a little brief rundown of what took place before this, um, Yahweh Shai, as he's always done, he just finished blasting the Pharisees, these law pushers, man, in a nice, sophisticated manner, right? Like, like only he could do it, right? So he just finished chiding them about inside of a parable, a parable, of course, because he loved to speak to them in parables. He chided them concerning being unfaithful, terrible stewards, being greedy and covetous, right? So this is what we pick up. You know, we want to continue to recognize our enemies, man. Remember who they are, remember what they look like, because remember, you know, we regenerate. There's nothing new under the sun. Those of us who are, we were, okay? And we are back now. We come back in our lot, we have to come and stand in our lot, all right? If you were a prophet, you come back as a prophet. If you're, you know, whatever you were, you come back in that lot and you carry, you know, different things from, you know, different spirits and, you know, different traits and, and characteristics from one lifetime to another. And in, in, in essence, you are who you've always been, all right? That's a great way to put it. You are who you've always been, all right? So, you know, Yahweh Shai's enemies are our enemies. And when you can recognize his enemies, you can, you can recognize why, the motives for the things that they say, what they do, how they move. Why are these people so adamant on holding on to the law of Moses? Why are they so staunch and strong against the law of liberty? Strong against the commandments of Yahweh Shai, strong against Yahweh Shah's existence for those who don't believe in the New Testament at all, for those who don't believe in Yahweh Shah at all, we call them Old Testament only Israelites, right? The dumbest sect of Israelites to be a part of, right? Because nothing about what they believe makes sense. You know, the law pushers who believe in holding on to the law of Moses, but they still believe in Yahweh Shah, see, they're lost. They have issues, but the law, the uh, Old Testament only Israelites, the dumbest of the dumb, right? So this is what we have to contend with out here. And you guys, you gotta be able to recognize them, all right? So, you know, this is what we're doing. We're constantly reading and paying attention to all of the descriptions, looking at their characteristics, because if you can't tell them by their visual cues, you will be able to recognize them by their fruit, okay? You will know them by their fruit. So you have to know, what is that exactly? What are, what are their fruit? What is their fruit? Okay, once you can identify that in, in the scripture, then you can identify them in this time, all right? So again, Yahweh Shai is fresh off of chastising and chiding these law pushers, these Pharisees, man, in a parable about being unfaithful, terrible stewards, and covetous, greedy, all right? Let us begin, Luke 16 and 14. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money they, they were covetous, 
heard all this, everything that Yahushua had to say, and scoffed at him. Don't they do this now? They hear everything that we have to say concerning Yahushua, concerning his doctrine, concerning the law of liberty that he pushed and gave to us, and they scoff at us. But remember, no servant is greater than his master. They scoffed at him. They're going to scoff at us. Be proud when they do it. All right, take it as a badge of honor. All right, verse 15. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but the father knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of the father. See, here we are again, Yahweh Shai, giving reverence to his head, to who's above him. He's not saying, I am the highest, right? Me, 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 me. That's not what he's doing here, right? Okay, you like to appear righteous in public. Sounds familiar? Sounds familiar? They get out there in public, put the fringes on. They got the, the ephods on. They got the, you know, the, the, uh, the garments on. You know, women got head wraps on and covered up. And, you know, they got their, their attire on and their, their, they got their borders of blue. You know, they're out there looking the part, right? They like to appear righteous in public. This is what they do, right? But the father knows their hearts and you got to, you got to understand the nature of these people. You got to understand what's really in their hearts. The father wants you to know because he knows. And if you are one of his, he wants you to know also. That's why you're getting this word. You can no longer claim ignorance, all right? What this world honors is the testable in the sight of the father, okay? Law keepers declare themselves righteous or they try to appear righteous before men. They seem to be knowledgeable of the scriptures. They seem that way. They have a bunch of videos. They got a big following and they speak very well more often than not, right? More often than not. Forever learning and never able to come to the true knowledge of the scriptures, right? So they'll speak the part, the part, they'll look the part, you know, speaking very well, confidently speaking in their chosen subject matter. See, confidently speaking in their chosen subject matter because they can only speak confidently in their chosen subject matter. And then even in that, they're, they're speaking confidently, but they're still lacking in understanding. So don't be fooled by the confident display by the confident delivery of their information, right? Man, they they slay people of lesser or or little or no understanding. They're sharp with the word. Even again, even if they don't understand, they they wield it like a blunt object and they can still do you harm. They do you the most harm when they don't understand it than when they do. Right? Because they because when they do that, do it under those circumstances, they genuinely appear to be giving you the right information. And that's the worst because your spirit one, can't, can't even pick up on the fact that they're being disingenuous, right? That they're conniving. They have a sinister motive. No, no, no. Your, your spirit is saying, man, this brother seems like he loves me and he's genuine and he's sincere and he's really delivering this word and truth and sincerity. So then you get bamboozled by that blunt instrument because it's not sharp. It's not sharp because their, their understanding of the word is dull, right? So the unlearned two-third Israelites watching them, highly esteem them, highly esteem them. But they are an abomination. They are detestable to Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai. Right? Right. Let's keep it moving. All right, let's get 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Remember, know thy enemy, Israel. Know thy enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Let's go. And this is the KJV version, by the way, for the sake of following along. For we are unto the Father, a sweet savor of Hamashiach and them that are saved and in them that perish to the one. Well, let's, let's not rush past. 
That's that verse. Let's let's repeat it and let's break it down. For we, the elect, are unto the Father a sweet savor of Hamashiach in them that are saved and in them that perish. Okay? To the one, now let's just go ahead and, and, and get both verses, then I'll break it down. To the one, we are the savor of death, unto death. Ugh. Quite the stench to one group of people. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? See, the Lord's men are like a sweet smell that's similar to Yahweh Shai, to the Father. So in other words, the, we, the Lord's men, we, we, give, we give the Father nostalgia about his pride and joy, his first fruit of the first fruits, Yahweh Shai. We're similar to Yahweh Shai. So we are a sweet smell to the Father that's like the sweet smell of his beloved Yahweh Shai. That's that's quite the that's quite the thing to to say. But our smell is perceived differently by the elect who will be saved than it is perceived by the two thirds that will perish. Okay, so the elect and the two thirds, both groups, will have drastically different impressions and smells, perceptions of the smell of the elect, okay? We're gonna come across differently. The elect is gonna be like, man, you guys are a breath of fresh air. Man, brother, I, I love you bringing out this word, man. I, you're bringing me closer to the Father. You're bringing me closer to Yahweh Shai, man. They're gonna love the smell, the savor, so to speak. But the two-thirds, oh boy, they're going to detest the aroma, the savor of the elect. We're reminiscent of a of stink, <laughs> something grossly detestable to their senses because what we speak condemns them. It makes them feel bad. It reveals to them who they are. They hate to get this word that we deliver because it convicts them, okay? It convicts them. To the two thirds, we smell like death. And to the chosen elect, we are the beautiful smell of life and the beautiful smell of hope. All praise Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shai because it's him that makes us so intricate, the same word can smell like death to one person and smell like the most beautiful scent, the most beautiful aroma to another. All right, we're gonna stay in 2 Corinthians, but we're gonna get, let's go, let's get the next chapter. So we're gonna get 2 Corinthians chapter three, okay? We're gonna begin at verse one. Ministers of a new covenant. Ministers, of a new covenant. That would be the law of liberty pushers, all right? Those of us that believe in Yahweh Shai's commandments, we are the ministers of the new covenant. The law of Moses believers, they are the ministers of the old covenant that has waxed old and passed away, right? We got, and that's the stench we got to get rid of. Verse, verse one. Do we begin again? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm sorry. Let me slow down. I just realized. All right, copy. Let's paste that. Let's get this in the NLT, okay? We want to stay in the NLT for, for the bulk of the learning. Certain things we will get out of the KJV, but for the most part, we're going to rock in the NLT for edification of the greater part portion of the body. All right? All right. Are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others who need to bring you letters of recommendation or who ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. The only letter of recommendation we need is you ourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. 
Clearly, you are a letter from Hamashiach showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living power. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in the Father through Hamashiach, our great trust in the Father through Hamashiach, the bridge to the Father, not the supplanter of the Father, right? Okay, let's keep it going. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualifications come from the Father. I know I am not qualified to do anything on my own. That's why before I begin to do the lesson, I pray, I get into the spirit. I pray for the Father to bless the lesson, to fill me up with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, right? To divulge his secrets, his mysteries of his parables and the dark sayings and of the prophecies. I ask him to increase me in the Holy Spirit, to fill me with the spirit of might and the spirit of counsel so that, and to put his, his words in my mouth so that I can be an effective teacher. So I can deliver the word in, in due season, his word, the way he wanted delivered by me, because every one of us has a different gift. We have different set of, of, of attributes that the father wants to use. That's why he groomed every last one of us to be different. And there's people out there who need to hear the word from me broken down the way I do it, not because I'm special, but because the father has someone in mind who needs to hear it my way, right? That's how it is. He has certain teachers in mind for certain people, all right? He has been grooming me all my life for this purpose as he has done with the other brothers, groomed them all their life for this, for this purpose. And the same way he's groomed the law of liberty, the law of Moses pushers, for their purpose, you know, to lead the two thirds astray, to lead them off that, that cliff I keep talking about. It's a lot of bodies laying down there at the bottom of that ravine. All right, so he has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. All praises due. This is a covenant not written of laws, but of the spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. Again, the old written covenant ends in death for everyone who's under it, without exception, you guys, without exception, okay? Even for Yahweh Shai when he was under it, right? He died to it and gave us a, a newer, better covenant. See, and th this covenant is of the spirit. That's why the law is not necessary. The law was necessary as a guide to govern us in our child stage when we were immature, right? But once when we became more mature in our development, it was no longer necessary. The father had a different purpose. He, need, he had a different trajectory. He wanted to put our, uh, our salvation on our our journey back to him. And he had to do that through, our, through the spirit because the spirit is what changes us, right? The law attempted to change your actions. To get you, you know, but the spirit changes you, changes the man. And then that in turn causes you to change your actions. And it was a permanent change. The law didn't didn't lead to permanent changes. That's why you continue to have to, you know, offer up sacrifices all the time because it didn't change you, okay? The glory of the new covenant. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face for his face shone with the glory of the father even though the brightness was already fading away. Let's stop, let's get this for a second. Now, I, I wanna address the law of Moses pushes for a second, okay? Now, is the father giving his glory away to Moses because he used Moses 
as a conduit. He used Moses as a as a, an instrument to communicate with his people. You say the Father has given his, you know, that Yahweh couldn't have existed because the Father would not. He said that he, you know, to another he would not give his glory, but he hasn't given his glory away to Yahweh just like he hasn't given his glory away to Moses. He just gave Moses his own glory, the same way he gave Yahweh Shai his own glory. It's possible for two things to exist at once. It's possible for the Father to remain in his seat, on his throne, as the Almighty, as the top of the hierarchy, but still for Yahweh Shai to have an, a glory to himself that was given to him of the Father. So if Moses was able to, to be a prophet raised up by the Father, to be the go-between between himself and the people, why is it far-fetched for you to understand and believe that Yahweh Shai was raised up just like Moses was as a prophet to the people, a go-between between the Father and himself? See, put your logical hats on, people, okay? Put your logical hats on. For his face shone with the glory of the Father. Listen, Moses' face shined with the glory of the Father. But it's hard for you to believe that Yahweh Shai did the same. Yahweh Shai's face shined with the glory of the Father. You, you can't believe that. But you can believe that Moses' face shined with the glory of the Father. Right? That, that makes no sense. Verse 8, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit has given life? Shouldn't we? This is for you guys, the elect, for you guys listening, critically, decipher it, okay? Critically decipher this, ponder it. Should we not expect a far greater glory under the new covenant than the glory that was given under the old covenant? Don't things get better over time? If we were, if we were low and we were being brought up, don't you think that the Most High would give us something better and, and not something worse or not on par with what we had before. Otherwise, what's the purpose of changing? Why give us the law and then come and bring us something, some a new covenant, but the new covenant keeps us under the old way. That makes no sense. The new, the, the new covenant was always projected. It was always expected to come and, and usurp and do it and cause the old way to pass away. It was always the plan. Like I said, Deuteronomy 18 and 15, Moses said it to you himself. And then Deuteronomy uh, 18 and 18, I believe, or 18 and 19, the father in his own words told you. So we knew it was, it was projected in the Old Testament that we were going to be given a new way, that we were going to follow the law of Moses for a time. But then eventually the father was going to send us a new way, a new prophet who's going to bring us a new way, who's going to bring us new commandments. It was always temporary. That's according to the scripture. That's not my interpretation. That's according to the scripture. That's in the Old Testament. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with the father? because the new way is what makes us right with the Father. The old way, the old covenant, the law of Moses never made us right with the Father, never. That's why sacrifices was necessary all the time. We had to do it over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. All it did was bring us condemnation. It kept us in remembrance of our sins. But that was the point, right? The point of the law was to reveal to his people their sins. He had to show us our sins. He had to show us who we were, how we needed to be changed. And he wanted to show us that we couldn't do it without him. We couldn't make ourselves perfect. He let us try. He let us see that we need him. He always want us to need him. He always want us to know that without me, 
You're nothing. I am everything. I am everything. Let's see how, how you fare without me. Go ahead, give it a try. Try to do it on your own. Let's see how that works out for you. He wants us to know there is no way but him. That if he doesn't take care of us, we're shit ass out of luck. We're fucking screwed. And that's that was made obvious to us. Chapter after chapter, book after book, prophet after prophet, story after story, instance after instance, right? Without fail. The law never made us perfect. We just continue to sin. In fact, we spiral more and more into sin as time progressed. That's why it was necessary for him to bring it all to an end and send us a better way to pull us out of it and back to himself, which was the purpose. But you guys don't believe it. You don't believe in his love. You don't believe that he wanted us to come back towards him. You think that he wanted to keep pushing us away, that he hates us. He wants to destroy us, even though he said, I would never do that. Right? You guys think that, you know, I don't know which I don't, I don't really know how you guys really reason in your own minds, right? That under the old covenant, that we could be saved. How could we be saved when he who we were betrothed to divorced us and put us away? But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna harp on that right now. We've done that plenty and I'm pretty sure we'll do that some more, but right now we'll keep it moving, okay? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? The new way remains forever because we've gone back to the order of Melchizedek. We've gone back to that which, which existed before the law of Moses. But the father, he changed not. Okay, if he changed not, then that means we should always been under the order of Melchizedek. Then the law of Moses never should have been a thing because the order of Melchizedek existed before the law of Moses. Right? Right. You see, that's what I'm saying. Your, your logic, your thinking, law pushers, it doesn't stand the test of time. You know, it, it doesn't stand up to, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Too many holes. You guys have built your house on sinking sand. Light winds come and beat upon your little rinky dink ass fucking house. Your little fucking piece of, piece of shit shack that you've built. And it collapses. That's the law pushers. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. See, the new way gives us such confidence so we can be bold. We can be very bold in this new way. They can't be, they couldn't be bold in the law of Moses. Not back then they couldn't, and they can't do it now. How do I know this? Because I watched them, I'm telling you. I'm in like 12 different Hebrew Israelite Facebook groups, man. And I stay in them just so I can keep the temperature and keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the nation. So I can stay properly energized to do this work so I can continue to address these different things that my enemies are doing. See, I, you got to know what your enemies are doing to know how to counteract them, right? You got to know how to counter what they're doing. So you got to be a studier. You just can't put your head in the sand and do your own thing. You got to recognize who your enemies are. You got to recognize their methods. How do they think? What drives them? What motivates them? What destroys them? How to kill them? Lex Luthor couldn't defeat Superman without learning first about kryptonite. He studied him, learned about this thing called kryptonite, right? I don't mean to bring fiction into this, but I know some of you need to hear things explained that way for you to understand, okay? They have no boldness. They're arguing and fighting and bickering all day long in their groups. I'm telling you, it's the funniest, saddest shit you can ever witness. Females are running fucking rampant in those groups, always trying to teach. And as a result, they're constantly getting chastised and checked. They're, they're just, they're, the women are pure heathenistic. And so they're constantly getting, getting run, run over by the men because, you know, sometimes the men ain't having that shit. There's a lot of simps in those fucking groups who, who kiss their asses and, and, and pom-poms come out for them and, and shit. They cheerlead for them. 
but then there's the other guys who don't, they don't be for that shit. And so they run them over so that you get the women complaining, oh man, see, they're the guys, man, they're the brothers of the truth, man, these guys, man, they're so disrespectful and they're this and they're that. And they, all they do is complain about the men all day, right? That's what women do. They try to half-ass fucking teach their dumbass fucking logic. And then they're, and when they're not doing that, they're complaining about the men. Then you get the other factions that are arguing against each other. Not everybody agrees on the name of the father or on the name of his son. Not everybody agrees that even his son even exists, right? So you got the two factions of the law pushers, the Old Testament only fighting with the, with the, with those who believe in the, in the New Testament, believe in Yahweh Shai, but they also believe that the law of Moses is still in effect. And then you get those who, you know, are, are of the, of the law of liberty. They believe in the law of liberty and, you know, and they're arguing the people then you get those who believe in the law of liberty but they're calling on jesus and you see what i'm saying like it's it's so many different factions so many different sects that is fucking head racking you know what i mean and it's just arguing and bickering all day seen a guy post yesterday he said man i've been disrespected more since i came into this truth than i've ever been disrespected by outsiders listen to that i get more disrespect and 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 shit on a regular basis from my own people, my own brethren in this truth than I've ever gotten from the heathens. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. That's the life of the two thirds, man. These are the people we gotta get the fuck away from. That's all the law of Moses does. It brings bickering, contention, and strife. And I witness it every day. Every single fucking day, I watch it. Like I said, it's the funniest, saddest shit that you can see. But continuing on. But the people's minds, oh, pardon me, verse 13. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. See, the glory of the law of Moses was destined to fade away, meaning it was written. It was always meant to happen that way. It didn't just come about, there was always its purpose was to be temporary, to exist for a time and purpose. Once that time and purpose had expired, the next thing had to come in, like seasons, right? These people are so dumb, the, their mindset is it will be the same as saying, you know, there is no such thing as, as, as winter or, or spring or fall because all we have is summer. The Most High gave us summer. So you know, and he changes not. So why, you know, he, we can't, that don't mean we can't never have fall and winter and spring because he he gave us summer to, to last throughout the entire year. But real life proves that was a lie, right? The most high has seasons for things. Everything has its due season. There's a time for this and a time for that. If you've read Ecclesiastes, you know. Ecclesiastes is the Old Testament, by the way. By the way. But anyway, let's keep moving. I could do this all day, talking about their, their stupidity and how nothing they say, their, their ideology, it doesn't make sense. Their doctrine is fucking dumb. Verse 14, but the people's minds were hardened. Listen, this is the father, like he did Moses. I mean, Pharaoh, right? And like he's did many others, like he's, he's done to many others throughout the Old Testament. The people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Hamashiach, Yahweh Shah. See, the people are still under that old veil. The old veil is there. Every time to this day, when the old covenant is read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. They are stuck. That See, this existed for them, and is it, it exists again for us. Remember, nothing new under the sun, right? Nothing new under the sun. Here we are once again, dealing with the same people 
who are put back in this time with their same mindset. They have a, a mindset that's over 2000 years old in this day and age, and they, they cannot understand the truth. This veil can be removed only by believing in Hamashiach. That's why they cannot get this truth, you guys. They don't believe in Yahweh Shai. So they cannot, they cannot have this veil removed. It is their curse to remain in the dark. Verse 15. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. That's what I'm saying. They cling to his writings and they cling to Moses' law and they idolize him, right? They put him on this pedestal. They put the law that came from him on this pedestal. But they don't even understand his writings. They don't understand the law in which they cling to. They don't understand the Old Testament at all. Their hearts are covered with that veil and they just can't get it. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This I know, trust me, my personal experience tells me this. You know why? Because I was once one of those dumb fuck Old Testament only Israelites. I confess it. I confess it. I was once one of them. This is why I know their doctrine. I know their belief system through and through. But see, I was just one of the one third who hadn't gone through my season yet of having the veil removed. Then my time came. I was sent the Holy Spirit. The Father said, okay, it's your turn. I'm gonna bring you out of that darkness. And then he sought allowing me to see what's been there the whole time. I read this book so much and I wasn't able to see what was there. Then all of a sudden, it was like there was something removed from me. That's how I know, I'm trying to tell you, this is how it is. It was like all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I can start to understand things I couldn't understand before. Things that used to not make sense, all of a sudden began to make sense. My old way of thinking became fucking stupid. It didn't make sense. I was like embarrassed that I even thought that way. I'm telling you, one day I sat in this fucking shower and I fucking cried, man. I ain't too big to say this. I'm strong enough in my masculinity and my manhood to say, I sat in the shower and cried for the disrespect that I showed to Yahweh Shai before he brought me into the light. I cried. It hurt me. Once I understood the truth, the way I acted before, I was cut deep. All praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai for pulling me out. And that's and that's the ministry that I've walked into with glee. Because it is my wish that I can reach just one brother or sister who was in the same position that I was in and bring them to this light, bring them back to their power. Because the feeling that you get once you cross over and you come back to your power, once you come out of that darkness, woo! You, I'm, I'm telling you, when you get filled with the spirit, it's different. There's, there's a transformation that sends you through. It's emotional. It's emotional. It's real. It's real. And it's a feeling that you want everybody to be able to experience. Especially when you love your people, you want all of them. I want all my brothers and sisters to to share in that feeling that I continue to feel every day. He's worked a great work in me. I'm no longer in the congregation of the dead. He has quickened my spirit and gathered me back into his flock. And I'm grateful. That's why I do the work. I don't do the work to earn salvation. I can't earn salvation. I have salvation. The receipts have already been given to us. We're just waiting for the manifestation of our redemption. I do the work because I have salvation, because I have liberty, because he loves me. He loves me. And I just want to do whatever I can for him 
I just want to do whatever I can, however I can help. I just want to be available. I want to be used. So here I am. Here I am. Lord willing, the same thing will happen to one of you, to some of you, to many of you. However that works out, the Father will make sure whoever needs this, whoever belongs to him, that he wants to be awakened by my voice. By his word in my mouth, he's going to bring them to this word. So if you're here, you're, you're, more, you're more likely than not one of the elect, and it's your turn, it's your season. Your veil is being removed. He's restoring you to his flock. You are now hearing his voice again. That familiar voice that you once knew, you're hearing it and you're coming back. So all of us, oh, pardon me, let's get, let's get verse 16 again. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had, who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Yes, he does. You go through an actual metamorphosis. You change, you change. You become a different person. You shed that old man and you become, you put that new man on. And it changes your actions. It changes everything about you that's contrary to him. You're just going to start making all those changes. You're going to know in your spirit what pleases him and what doesn't. And you're going to change. And as you change, the people around you are going to start to become more and more distant. That, that separation is going to happen. Be aware of it because he, he's, he separates those that are his from the rest of the world. He called when he calls you back into his flock, and you, you, that means you you're officially disconnected from the world, and the world are, is going to begin to hate you. They're going to begin to separate themselves from you, and you're going to begin to separate yourselves from them. And next thing you you know, you're going to be on the island, <laughs> looking around for other people. Am I here by myself? Damn, is anybody else out here but me? That's how it is. That's exactly how it is. Um, let's see, let's get second Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, since the father, the father in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or to distort the word of the father. We tell the truth before the father. And all who are honest know this because your spirit bears witness with the word, with his truth. So those who belong to the father, they, they know his voice when they hear it and they know the truth when they hear it. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Listen, if the good news, the gospel we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing, those who are scheduled to die anyway, the two thirds. This, good, this gospel was hidden only from those who are, who are scheduled to die. The two thirds, the heathens, all of them, they can't get it. That's who that talks about. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. That's his job. That's his job. He's out blinding the minds of those that don't believe in Yahweh Bash and Yahweh Shai. He's doing a great work. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They can't see it no matter what. This is the work of the Father, right? It is at his command. Only those that belong to Yahweh, Bashem, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, have the veil removed, are taken out of that darkness. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Hamashiach, who is the exact likeness of the Father. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Yahweh Shai Hamashiach is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Yahweh Shai's sake. For the Father, Yahweh, who said, let there be light in the darkness, 
has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of the Father that is seen in the face of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. And that's exactly what it's like, you guys. It's like being in the dark. And then the next thing you know, a light comes on. A light comes on. And the light is warmth and love and uh, information transfer, a knowledge download. And it's a transformation process that, that if you're blessed enough to be a part of the elect and go through it, you can't even explain it enough to make the two thirds even crave it. They can't, they can't even, they can't even, they can listen to what I'm saying and, it's, and it sounds like bullshit to them. They don't desire that light that I'm talking about. They rather be in that darkness. They're not gonna try to seek it out because it's not in them, it's not in them. It's not given to them to have that desire lest they convert and be and be healed. And he doesn't want them to convert. He doesn't want, want them to be healed. He doesn't want them to be saved. He wants them to keep that same energy. Keep that same energy. See you at the barbecue. <laughs> Verse seven. We now have this light shining in our hearts, the elect, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from Yahweh, not from ourselves. Absolutely. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. See, that spirit of despair and confusion, that's for the two thirds. Not for you who are the, of the elect. It's not for us. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by Yahweh. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Hamashiach Yahawashai, so that the life of Yahawashai may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Yahawashai. This was back then. So that the life of Yahawashai will be evident in our dying bodies. This is the reason why the elect are saved in this lifetime and not appointed to wrath. We live in, under constant persecution and danger of death. And then eventual, eventually we suffered the death. So we've paid our, our penance in order to get into the kingdom. The two thirds have not. That's why wrath is meant for them in this time. Jacob's trouble, that's their lot. The elect shall be saved from it. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in Yahweh, so I spoke. Yes, I have the same kind of faith. I believe in Yahweh, so I speak. We know that Yahweh, who raised the Lord Yahweh Shai, will also raise us with Yahweh Shai and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as Yahweh's grace reaches more and more people, his grace, the Father's grace, reaches more and more people, there will be thanks, there will be great thanksgiving. And the Father will receive more and more glory. See, that's what he wants. He wants his glory. He wants there to be great thanksgiving. He wants to receive more and more glory. Look, that's the Father. He always wants glory, not just some glory. He wants all the glory. He wants more and more. Why would he allow you to sanctify yourselves through the law? Why would he allow you to justify yourselves through your own works? Come on now. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Our time is almost up, Israel. We're almost out of here. Yet, they produce for us a glory that, is, that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Don't look at the troubles you can see now, Israel. There's so many things going on in this time and they have to happen, okay? Just remember that none of the plagues, none of these judgments are gonna descend upon you. They're not meant for you, okay? 
Yahweh Shai is the lamb of our Passover. We have we are covered with his blood. So when the plagues strike, we're covered. They pass over us and they fall on those who do not have the covering, those who do not have the white robes on. That's for them. Okay, keep that in mind. So stay strong, stay vigilant, continue to be a watchman, stay on that tower, continue to discern the times, the seasons, because it's important. The timeline, the father has a timeline. Everything has its place in his timeline. The law of Moses faded from the timeline. It has not been brought with us to this point in the movie, okay? It has perished, it has vanished. It is no more, but to those who cling fast to it, to them, it still is and will be. And because they cling to it, they're going to be judged by that law. They got to keep the whole law. They got a sacrifice of their own flock in the temple to the Levites. Look around. You see any Levites? Where's the temple? How many of these broke ass, poor ass, downtrodden ass fucking Israelites have their own flocks, farms, animals and shit? How are they keeping the law? Hmm? How are they doing it? If the law is still in effect, how are they keeping it? They're not. So that means they're doomed to destruction because there is no way for them to atone for their sins according to the law. That means there is no plan of salvation for you if you're an Old Testament only Israelite. You fucking dummy. I mean, got me about to put on my, my red fox real quick. You big dummy. Fucking dumbasses. A bunch of fucking Lamonts out here, man. For, for, for all you, you people that's too young out there, go on and research Red Fox, man. Well, watch the, watch Sanford and Son one time for the one time, and laugh with your boy, laugh with your hawk, man. One time, one time if you're too young to know. And for those of you who know, boy, it's fucking clown shit, right? Fucking clown shit. But uh, get ready for the fire. If you're clinging on to that law of Moses, get ready for the fire. Get all your marshmallows and, you know. You get your lamb, <laughs> get everything that, that is not an abominable food. Get it all ready for the barbecue. But unfortunately for you, it ain't gonna be until the last minute when you realize you're what's on the menu. You're what's on the menu. Oh, it's a party. It's going to be a party, all right. Just not the kind of party you're expecting. You're anticipating the day of the Lord. But what is it to you? Are, are you sure you really, you, you, do you really want it to hasten? Mm, I don't really think you... You understand what you're wishing for. So be very, very careful what you wish for. Be very, very careful, okay? Because you're gonna get it. You're gonna get it in more than one. You're gonna get it when you get it. Do you get it? All right, speaking of get it, let's get out of here. All right, this, this lesson was a great one. This was a productive study. I pray that you are all edified, that you all are increased in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding today. I appreciate your time as always, Israel. My heart and my love goes out to my nation, to my brethren, 
to my sisters that are of the elect. I love you. Let's keep building. We're going to see each other one day. We're going to be standing side by side one day. Let's get it together. Let's continue to do this work of waking up the, the father's sheep, waking up the elect of Israel. All right. We got to keep bringing back those that Yahweh Shai purchased with this blood. We got to we got to call everybody to the assembly. All right. And this is the call going out. Each one of you who are able to get this word. I hope that you guys will continue to build yourselves up to the point where you, too, can become a teacher of this law of liberty. And you begin to spread this gospel in truth and sincerity. But we got work to do. We want to we want to get out of here. We don't get out of here. We can't even get to the next stage until the elect has been sealed and awakened. OK. So let's pray for that. Every day. And let's work on that every day. This concludes Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, part 37. Stay tuned for the next one coming at you real soon. Giving all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh Bahashem Hamashiach Yahweh Shai. All praises due. Shalom, Israel. <laughs>